pleasure to welcome you to today's feature webinar covering a very relevant topic, Cloud Data Control, the Key to Successful Cloud Adoption. My name is David Stott. I'm the Senior Director of Product Management at Prospectus. Before we start, I, just, I do want to share a few housekeeping details. First, this presentation is being recorded, and all attendees will receive an email following the event with a link to download the slides and access the recording. If you do have questions throughout the presentation, please enter them into the questions box on your screen, and we'll get to questions at the end of the session. By all means, please keep your questions coming. And any questions we don't get to on the presentation will be answered by one of our featured speakers offline. Lastly, it may be easier to view the presentation if you maximize your screens. You can do this by clicking on the icon in the upper right corner of the GoToWebinar window. For today's agenda, we'll be starting with a summary of both the business benefits and potential barriers facing the enterprise as it considers public cloud adoption. Following this, we'll review different methods of cloud control that an enterprise can leverage to address broader compliance and security needs. Lastly, we'll close with some solution approaches and a case study before wrapping up with questions and answers. Put simply, as key takeaways from today's session, we hope we shed some light on both the opportunities and barriers posed by public cloud adoption, and as well that there are very valid, tested, and proven approaches to address the need to maintain control when the enterprise adopts cloud technologies. At this point, I would like to introduce our first featured speaker, Jerry Grealish. Jerry is the Vice President of Marketing and Products at Prospectus. Jerry is responsible for defining and executing Prospectus's marketing and product vision. Previously, Jerry ran product marketing for the TNS Payments Division, helping create the marketing and product strategy for its payment, gateway, and tokenization and encryption security solutions. Jerry is a frequent author and speaker on cloud data security issues across industry events and publications. Jerry is a member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals and the Cloud Security Alliance. Thanks, David, uh, and uh, thanks for the attendees of the, uh, the webinar for spending some time with us today. Um, David, we can go to the next slide. Uh, what I wanted to start to do over the next 10 to 15 minutes is cover the, the, the two first topics that David referenced in the agenda. First, I want to share the major reasons why enterprises tell us they're moving to the cloud. And then I'll share a few of the barriers that they've also shared with us that they say have been standing in their way. I think the first, uh, or the best way to maybe look at the drivers that are compelling them to consider cloud is to look at this slide, which captures some information that IBM put out that I think is a pretty good framework to describe the, the benefits and the drivers. And the, the first one I'll touch on, and it's going to be no surprise to anybody in the audience, has to do with cost. Uh, budgets are getting tighter. Many organizations are experiencing margin pressures in the recession, thankfully, that we're starting to come out of. Uh, so the ability in the cloud model to reduce CapEx and OpEx costs and move to a utility cost model versus a fixed cost model when you compare it to an on-premise sort of software deployment is a huge deal. So cost is a key element that pushes people to consider the cloud. Second, and this goes back to the utility model that I just mentioned, cloud is easy to scale. So that people can call up, they can order more capacity, and then you have what you need to meet your additional requirements. It's simple. The, the third one that's covered in the IBM study is this, this notion of market adaptability. And said another way, that means that things get done more quickly. You can have faster releases, more functionality more quickly. You have partner ecosystems to, to round out that functionality. The net of it is that the businesses get what they need to compete and boost efficiencies faster than ever before when they're using cloud-based applications. The fourth one is this idea of uh, mass complexity. And the idea here is that you get all the benefits that I spoke about, but now you can do it and, and outsource the headaches of having to do bespoke development, integration, support. All of that is now handled by this new entity, this cloud service provider. So it's a very compelling benefit. The, the fifth, uh, IBM talks about context-driven variability. But you know, this is really sort of consulting speak for basically saying that the economics of the, the cloud delivery model now allow these cloud service providers to build solutions that are much more targeted. Um, and it's no longer a one-size-fits-all sort of approach on big software project development. They can be very focused sets 
of deliveries having to do with very specific sets of market needs. And the last one is this idea of this ecosystem connectivity, and I mentioned it a bit earlier. We, we see things like this with Salesforce.com's App Exchange or the Oracle Cloud Partner Network. These ecosystems are now being built up around cloud platforms that lead to an incredible amount of innovation and creativity in terms of new applications and the extensions on those applications that can be used by the enterprise to boost revenues, decrease costs, et cetera. So some pretty compelling benefits uh, on, on this slide. And if you look at the next slide, um, David, it really, I think, boiled a lot of them down into the, the, the seventh notion, which is basically, if you think about all the six that I just described, starting with cost, it really comes down to total cost of ownership. At the end of the day, all those things, whether they're taking um, a cost out of the equation, boosting efficiencies, if you look at it from just a pragmatic and a financial statement analysis, the cloud just offers tremendous TCO benefits. And for the folks that are sitting around the table in the enterprise with their finance counterparts, uh, it brings smiles to their faces because the, the cost of doing things is just dramatically different with the cloud. So if you look at a couple of the data points on the slide, uh, I won't read through them. The, the audience can take a look. It's not just the enterprise. It's also government and public sector. So the, the first data point points to the fact that over $25 billion is spent annually maintaining legacy IT systems. Now, this is why things like FedRAMP and the U.S. federal government hold such promise because of these TCO sort of benefits. So you know, clearly there's a lot of compelling drivers on some, why somebody would consider the cloud. The next uh, slides, a couple slides, I'll talk about some of the barriers or, the, or the, 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 the inhibitors to cloud adoption as we've talked to some enterprise and public sector customers. And, you know, it's clear that lots of enterprises are still pursuing this on-premise route. Uh, the market data from folks like Gartner supports that that's the case. And if you, if you look at the data, um, and it comes out in conversations we've had with, with folks as well, the number one issue or concern that comes up time and time again when asked about the cloud concerns is indeed security. And if you dig into it, specifically about security, it tends to be a focus on data security. And on, on this chart, and I apologize to the audience, it's a bit of an eye chart, but hopefully you'll be able to see it in more detail when we do the follow-up and send out the slides. Uh, this chart is a, is a piece of survey data from a, a Ponyman report. And it asked enterprise execs uh, the same question in 2011 and 2012 about their concerns around the cloud and security. And a couple things came out as, as primary um, uh, insights from the, this research. The first is, if you, if you look at it, there's not a lot of change in, changes in perceptions between 2011 and 2012. If anything, concerns around moving to the cloud or having to do with security have increased year on year. Um, the third one down, actually, is a pretty insightful data point. It points to the fact that over 53% uh, of enterprises point to security concerns as being the primary thing that's holding back cloud adoption. And the two bullets below that, or the two questions below that, indicate that over half the respondents would actually look more favorably to the cloud if better tools existed to secure the data. So clearly, the, the, uh, the, this issue of security is the key barrier. It used to be both kind of security and maybe availability were concerns around cloud. It sounds like, seems like now the availability issue has been really tackled, and it's really security and data security is a primary uh, inhibitor, and it's backed up by some of these survey results. The next slide talks a little bit about you know, trying to get uh, an understanding of what's behind these fears, these perceptions. And you know, in the security space, there's quite a bit of debate about whether or not the security concerns on cloud are overblown. You know, are they realistic? Or is it just some paranoia, FUD that's being put out there? And this survey question starts to get at the core of it. Uh, and quite frankly, it's sometimes difficult to get hard numbers on the, the, the amount of security issues that have occurred and or the service issues that have occurred. Because providers and sometimes enterprises don't want to trumpet these sorts of things, no surprise. But the, the report, the Ponyman report, asks a question around uh, kind of this core issue. And the survey data uh, asks questions about security lapses that enterprises have experienced, as well as service disruptions. And a couple of things are clear. This kind of gives the, the broad cut across multiple regions. But a couple of things are clear in the survey response. A, uh, enterprises are indeed experiencing these sorts of issues. Uh, and B, 
Again, they seem to be experiencing more of them in 2012 versus 2011. Don't have the 2013 data yet, but I'd imagine we're going to see that trend continue. So it does appear that their comments and concerns around security tend to be based on some relevant personal experiences, and it's not just a perception sort of issue. So I could talk a while about you know, this uh, space because it is kind of hotly debated, but I do want to move on to the next area that we see quite a bit of concern around, and that has to do with this notion of data residency. And when we bring up this concept, some folks, especially outside of the U.S., understand it quite well. For those that are in the U.S., I'll just describe it for a second. Um, you know, what do I mean by data residency? Well, to put it simply, if data is subject to what's called a data residency requirement, it means the data must remain local or resident within a specified geographic jurisdiction. And many countries outside of the U.S. have these sort of requirements. Um, indeed, this slide is sort of a data privacy, data residency heat map that Forrester published. The red having to do with countries or covering countries that have the most restrictions, orange a, a few restrictions but not many, et cetera, green and blue uh, decreasing levels of restrictions. And you know, when, when you dig into these, these countries and, and the reasons for why they have these laws in place, it has to do with the confusion in the cloud model about whose laws take precedence when data flows between borders. You know, the notion of a cloud is somewhat antithetical to this whole idea of borders. A cloud doesn't have borders. But when data goes out into a cloud environment, questions then start to appear about who's in charge. Is it the, the country of the data owner? Is it the country of the service provider? Uh, what if the service provider has data centers in different locations? You know, it could be very confusing. And that's where this whole idea of data residency really starts to take on a life of its own. And even within Europe, you'll see that there's a, a patchwork quilt of law. There's the EU Data Protection Directive, but also a mix of country-specific requirements that place a number of restrictions on what data can be stored, where it can be stored, who can access it, um, you know, where it can be placed, who, can, who reports on it. So there's just a whole host of issues having to do with uh, residency. And penalties for noncompliance can be pretty severe. Just to kind of bring it to life as an example, let's say you're a Swiss bank and you need to comply with some fairly rigorous data privacy laws that require you to keep certain data fields associated with your banking customers within your borders. Um, how can you use a cloud provider that has its data centers actually in the United States? And even if the cloud provider was to, for instance, have a Swiss data center, you know, where's the backup? Data may flow there at some point. So these are clearly tough issues to tackle. And again, we see that outside of the states quite a bit. Within the U.S., we see more compliance and privacy-driven uh, barriers, and I'll cover that on this next slide. And we see this mostly within vertical markets, um, where there's a mix of compliance and data privacy regulations that these vertical companies need to adhere to. So for example would be HIPAA and high-tech regulations in the healthcare industry that mandate that PHI information. So patient information, 18 fields that can be used to identify a particular patient. Uh, regulations that require that information to be treated in certain ways. And there's rough equivalents in many different verticals. Within financial services, there's regulations called Gramm-Leach-Bliley. Within the payment card industry, there's things called PCI DSS that govern how payment card details need to be secured. Within education, there's regulations called FERPA that um, dictate or define for educational institutions how they need to treat student data. And then within, um, uh, within the U.S., uh, organizations that do work with the government uh, on products that are on the U U.S. munitions list, they need to adhere to something called ITAR, which governs how data must be treated and protected. So as an example, again, just to bring it to life, suppose you're a defense-related company uh, doing work with the government and you need to uh, think about using the cloud, but you need to maintain ITAR compliance. Now, part of ITAR specifies that no foreign nationals can have access to the sensitive data. So if you're thinking about the cloud, you'd need to think about the primary and the backup locations of the data center of the cloud service providers. But it's actually more than just that. You'd have to think about, can my cloud service provider guarantee that nobody outside of the US or a non-US citizen will have remote access to the data for routine things like maintenance. So you can see that there's multiple layers you need to consider. And at the end of the day, it's the user of the cloud service on the hook for the compliance. So between that and the other two issues, residency and then the security concern, I think you can see why people 
take pause when they're thinking about making the move to the cloud, even with the, the benefits that I described early on in the, the webinar. And if you think about it, on the next slide, just to kind of tie it all up, it's, it's you know, these issues, security, residency, compliance, they're all exacerbated in the context of the cloud. Because when I'm adopting cloud, you know, really I'm ceding some level of control over now to third parties, namely in this situation, the cloud service provider themselves. And in the old world, the on-premise world of software deployments, you know, I had tools, procedures um, in place to ensure that only certain people could access certain types of data, et cetera. And I knew where my data was being stored. And this is clearly not the case in this whole paradigm of the, the cloud. So the real challenge, again, if you think about it for today's enterprise security architects, who know that the cloud is somewhat of an irresistible force and that their organizations are going to figure out some way to adopt it, the real challenge for these folks is to figure out a way to reinsert the required level of enterprise IT control while enabling their organizations to make the move to the cloud so they can benefit from all the, the sorts of things that I described early on in the webinar. So well, hopefully that kind of sets the foundation for the first elements uh, that David talked about in the agenda, the, the barriers and, and the benefits. At this point, I'll hand back over to David. Uh, he'll introduce Patrick Harding from Ping, uh, who look more closely at the issues associated with controlling access to cloud. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jerry. I think those, those examples you gave really added some color. At this point, I would like to introduce our second featured speaker, Patrick Harding. Patrick is responsible for Ping Identity's technology strategy and brings more than 20 years of experience in software development, networking infrastructure, and information security to the role of Chief Technology Officer for Ping Identity. As an active leader in the identity security space, Patrick is a founding board member for the Information Card Foundation, a member of the Cloud Security Alliance Board of Advisors. He's on the steering committee for OASIS and actively involved in the Kantara Initiative and Project Concordia. Patrick is a regular speaker at RSA, Digital ID World, SAS Summit, Burton Catalyst, and other conferences. Patrick, if you could join us for the next section. Um, thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, as Jerry was saying, uh, I'm going to sort of focus now on what it means to control access as opposed to uh, controlling or protecting um, data, which is something that Jerry's going to follow up with in a little bit. So, you know, just a couple of high-level slides to kick this off. Um, there are a number of trends really challenging that, that status quo around how we secure the cloud. Um, some of the other things that, you know, really factored into this, certainly from an identity standpoint or an access standpoint, is not just about the apps and the data, but it's also about um, mobile access, um, especially when you can now go direct from client to cloud, um, uh, in, in some instances, as well as social, because social identities are cloud identities, and they certainly factor into, into this when people are considering things like cloud access. So as we look at the next slide, um, I'm sort of simplifying this a little bit and, 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 and taking us back to the old models where um, life was a lot simpler when we could just worry about our users, our apps and our data all happily sitting within the enterprise uh, within a single domain and, and protected by uh, the firewall, which is a world I lived in you know, 15 years ago. But looking forward to the next slide, um, today's reality you know, is obviously um, rather different. Uh, we have um, uh, all sorts of SaaS apps um, running out there, uh, all independent. Uh, we have um, users and workforce all looking to leverage their own devices from a BYD standpoint and also leveraging mobile applications um, as well. And then we also have partner applications too where critical data you know, is running you know, outside in your partner environments. So really what's shifted here is, is sort of, you know, a lot, you know, I would say everything, a great marketing term, but a lot of what impo what's important is now on the outside um, looking in, so to speak. And, and that's actually inverted from where we were 10 or 15 years ago. So if you move forward to the next slide here, if we look at some of the business risks associated with this, and certainly from an identity and access standpoint, the first one and most common one we hear about is um, essentially the fact that users are now leveraging IDs and passwords to access all of these external cloud-based applications that are outside of IT's control. And you know, that, 
that just breeds you know a number of um, issues as it relates to well the, the fact that you know, most enterprises have spent the last 15 years trying to eliminate passwords internally and now they're seeing manifest again and again externally across these cloud apps. It manifests in issues like management costs, I mean password resets uh, and help desk calls are expensive. I mean there's you know years and years of statistics that show that a help desk call can cost anywhere from $20 to $50 per call just to reset those passwords. Um, but uh, in addition, um, and as important, is the un unauthorized use problem. Where one example is that when or when users you know change roles or leave an organization, it's it's rare that they end up being deprovisioned from those um, cloud and SaaS applications in a timely manner, and hence they still would have access to those SaaS and cloud applications. Uh, because they have an ID and password that still works because they actually haven't been deprovisioned. De um, so you know, you know that breeds to also issues about how we get users added to those applications and are they in the right roles uh, when they're added into those cloud applications? Um, who has access to these applications? When or why? Visibility issue. Um, one of the things we see a lot is that there is you know administrative web web based administrative interfaces in these cloud apps and SaaS apps where admins can just come in and manually add user accounts. Uh, again, it's loss of control uh, from an IT standpoint to even understand which users are which you uh, are using which applications in the cloud. Um, and then lastly, there's sort of an external identity risk. I mean it's, it's managing uh, these external identities is expensive. It, it's it's time consuming and um, what we tend to find is organizations want to push responsibility for managing uh, those external identities like your partner identities back onto your partners uh, and have them be responsible for it. So you know a, a number of risks uh, manifest here. Uh, another one that's not mentioned um, is phishing um, whereby you now have with these all these cloud and SaaS applications a number of login forms that exist that are you know vulnerability points for attackers and bad guys to come in and uh, and and target phishing attacks against your workforce. Another big issue. So shifting now, I mean, if we if we now start to think about how the perimeter needs to look different, it really starts to you know focus now on where identity uh, plays a key role in helping protect um, these applications whereby you really want to start thinking about how I control access, not at the IP layer that you might have done with firewalls, but at the identity layer where you want to control and understand who is accessing those applications and, 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 and look to implement single sign-on such that um, those users or your workforce don't have to be providing IDs and passwords, separate IDs and passwords to every single one of those applications. So we think of this as you know, organizations need to think about their identity infrastructure becoming the single point of control that allows these users to access not just your internal applications, but also these external and SaaS applications as well. Um, so this sort of next generation identity function uh, really helps you know, you know, manage this dynamic model and can work across mobile devices as well as internal and external users on browser devices as well. So if we shift uh, looking forward a little bit, where Ping helps in this regard is, um, you know, we, we, we sort of look at this in, in, in two ways. One is that most organizations have already invested heavily in an in identity infrastructure that they've used internally. And you know, whether it's a directory, whether it's an access management or identity management system, there is no reason that that, uh, that investment can't be um, leveraged with the cloud, with cloud apps, um, SaaS apps, whatever it might be. Um, the key here then is to provide an infrastructure or, that can extend that directory, those directories and those uh, identity management systems to be used with those cloud and SaaS applications. That's where Ping's products come in to help um, provide either single sign-on mechanisms where you can take advantage of your directory-based authentication to be used with cloud and SaaS apps, or you can take advantage of your directory to manage user accounts 
whereby you might put all your Salesforce users in one group in the directory or your, um, your concur users in another group in the directory and then leverage your uh, you know, Pings products to essentially mirror those accounts out to all SaaS and cloud applications. So um, it's definitely um, important that people don't think that just because you're moving to the cloud and moving to cloud-based applications that there isn't, doesn't have to be a complete um, uplift and change of that existing identity management infrastructure. There are definitely ways to leverage what you have, primarily by using open standards and, and, and integrating with all of those SaaS and cloud applications with open identity standards. So if you shift to the next slide here, um, one of the things that um, we see that's uh, really important is to make it very visible and obvious to employees and end users to which cloud applications they have access to. And one way to manifest that is in something we call a cloud desktop, which is a way for IT to control which applications the end user has access to and you know through a basically a very simple web page but by um, clicking on any of these icons on this web page on this cloud desktop they get seamless the end user gets seamless access into those cloud cloud applications now the end user is only you know it's only these are icons are only visible to the end user if they have appropriate role or group memberships that means that they're allowed access to those applications and that's something that IT can sort of control and assure that there are accounts in place at those applications for this end user as well. And oh, by the way, I mean this, this desktop not only works in the browser interfaces uh, on your desktop, it also works on your, uh, on your iPad, your iPhone, your Android devices as well such that there is an identical experience there for the end user. So you know you now have one place, one place to both access applications from an end user standpoint without needing additional passwords, and one place for IT to control and provision users to those applications as well. So if we step forward a little bit um, to the next slide, um, we tend to think about this as you know you can solve this problem in a couple of ways. Um, generally speaking, we see the internal applications on premise as just being as important as the cloud applications um, like SaaS from an from a enterprise standpoint. The, you, know, you should really consider this to be a single architecture that can address all of these things. Uh, we do find that people are looking to you know, prefer to leverage their directory that's running on premise and that's where an identity bridge uh, can be used to bridge that directory after the SaaS applications. We're also seeing people saying, well, I, I'd like some of that functionality running as a service as well from an identity standpoint, which is why identity uh, as a service capabilities are important too. Um, so that um, you know, you know, organizations can, can take an advantage of SaaS for their identity management infrastructure. But again, there's a definite bridging here that occurs so that the uh, identity and directory infrastructure that's on premise can be leveraged with these um, SaaS applications, whether it's for authentication or authorization or provisioning for web or for mobile. Um, it's rare that we see people wanting to recreate all of that identity infrastructure on premise out in the cloud. Effectively. So then uh, wrapping up on the, on the last slide here, some of the best practices that we see people um, sort of focus on is that you know first of all um, separating identity from applications uh, really what that means is that um, you need your cloud vendors you need your SaaS vendors willing to allow their you their customers to manage the identities in those apps and to authenticate the users on behalf of those apps and they need to buy into um, supporting standards like SAML and uh, more for single sign-on and more recently SKIM uh, systems for cross-domain identity management for provisioning. By implementing those standards they allow you the enterprise to control how, the, how your workforce gets authenticated before accessing those apps and, and, and leveraging your own directories for managing how users get provisioned into those apps. 
Secondly, uh, eliminating passwords. It, it's it's you know imperative in my mind that we don't try and mask this problem by syncing passwords out to cloud apps or replicating them or hiding them in password vaults or whatever you might do. You really want to ensure that your users have one password that they know and use um, to, to authenticate to your enterprise and that can be leveraged um, seamlessly for access to all these SaaS applications. Now the benefit to that is if you can, if you can get to that point we can now start to more cost effectively add stronger authentication to that one that to that place your users authenticate where you can add uh, second factors of authentication to make that experience much stronger um, and, and much more secure um, much more cost effectively than trying to add strong authentication into every SaaS app directly uh, it just doesn't work as I mentioned adhering to standards is critical here um, you can't you can't do this if every SaaS and cloud application implements proprietary SSO or proprietary provisioning capabilities. We really need to drive to standards everywhere, which is something that Ping has been sort of pushing for for a long time. Um, a lot of this is driven by enterprises telling their vendors, their SaaS vendors, their cloud vendors, that they have to implement these standards like SAML and SKIM and OAuth um, uh, if they want their business. Uh, again, I, I touched on this previously. Um, you can leverage your existing identity infrastructure quite happily with the cloud to, uh, to ensure that the processes you put in place internally for controlling access to apps can be leveraged externally as well. It can definitely still function and work quite okay. Um, then lastly, um, we look for people to avoid building sort of purpose-built silos. Uh, one of the things that we see a lot is one, one group might build a customer identity infrastructure versus a partner identity versus a workforce identity um, and they, they end up leveraging a, you know, a mixed bag of stuff within different groups to do this. There is no, there's no reason that you can't um, sort of standardize on a single identity architecture that's standards based to address your cloud access problems not just for your workforce but also for your customers and your partners as well. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Jerry. Thanks, Patrick. That was excellent. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask Jerry to talk about some specific techniques like you've done, Patrick, for um, uh, cloud access. I'd like to ask Jerry to speak to some specific techniques regarding controlling cloud data location. Sure. Thank you. Um, it, it, what I'll do on the next couple slides is I'll talk about some techniques, as David mentioned, around uh, controlling location of cloud data. And then I'll move into the joint solution that's been developed together with Ping Identity and Perspexis that brings the two approaches together for kind of an overall control framework. Um, before I go into extending the, the, the kind of the idea of control, uh, data location control in the cloud, let me just describe two foundational techniques first um, to, to um, set the context for what I'll describe in a, a few slides. The first is this notion of encryption, which is a technique that uh, I see enterprises using to try to control where their data is being uh, put and used. Um, it's a process that is used, again, to protect information, and that information can be both in transit and in storage. And it involves the idea of uh, conversion of clear text data into something that's called cipher text. It uses the notion of a, a cipher key and a, an algorithm to convert that information into clear text uh, uh, format, and, uh, into ciphertext, and then back again. There's two important ideas that I want to uh, reinforce with encryption based upon what I just described. If somebody has the encryption keys, uh, they have access to the information. Pretty logical. And the other idea is that if somebody can basically unwind the approach or the, un or the algorithm, they can back into the clear text values from the encrypted values. So it's important, one, to make sure that you do control the encryption keys, and two, you need to ensure that the algorithm and the implementation approach of that algorithm that you're using is strong uh, because of that uh, issue that I mentioned before, the idea that if there's, uh, if there's weakened algorithms that they can basically be unwound and the, the clear text can be seen even without the keys. So look for third-party validated algorithms that have certain levels of certification, such as FIPS 140-2, et cetera. Uh, 
Um, next slide talks about the other technique that we see in this space of trying to control the location of information, and that's tokenization. And for members of the audience that have some familiarity with the payments industry, you'll be um, knowledgeable about this approach because it's been used for a number of years for folks that need to protect payment card details to help them comply with PCI DSS standards. Um, but now it's starting to be used in cases beyond payments. So we're seeing it used quite a bit to secure cloud data, things such as HIPAA, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the patient-related data. I've seen that used quite a bit, uh, tokenization used in that space as well as, as other compliance and data residency requirements. So, so what is it? Tokenization, again, it's a, it's a process that's uh, kind of a close cousin to encryption. Um, it's, it's used to basically anonymize sensitive data, such as the primary account number on a credit card or a debit card. But what's, what's used to actually replace the data uh, is what's called a token. And um, when you tokenize something, it, it, it uh, creates a token off the original value. And when you detokenize something, it brings the original value back from the token. And the question then becomes, well, how are these tokens created? And while there's various approaches to creating tokens, frequently they're simply randomly generated values that have no mathematical relation to the original data field. And, and that, that idea underlies the security that's inherent in this approach. It's nearly impossible to determine the original value of the sensitive data by knowing only the surrogate token value. And because of this, this idea that it's, uh, a token can't be reversed back to the original value, what we've seen, and I'll talk about it a bit on the next slide, is that tokenization is often the de facto approach to address one of the barriers that I mentioned earlier in the webinar, this idea of data residency. So, um, Just to bring it to life, uh, the next slide, I'll take an example of just a, a data field and, and just somebody's name. I'll use John to uh, describe the differences between the two techniques. Uh, if I encrypt the name John, uh, again, I'll, I'll use a formula known as a cipher to transform the original value, and I'll mask it into an unreadable form. The only way to bring it back into the readable form is to use this idea of a key, as I described. And the key can decode and encrypt the value and make the text meaningful again. So if I had a single key, I could unlock all the data in the cloud, if uh, there's a mathematical relationship between the encrypted values and the original clear text value. So again, important to use strong encryption and to make sure that you own the, the keys. Um, if I use tokenization, uh, as I described, it's, it's important, it's different uh, in, in an important way. And it, it doesn't use this whole paradigm of a lock and key. So instead, it uses this random value. And in essence, there's a lookup table, a data vault, that itself is encrypted, that's kept on site, typically inside of an organization's firewall. So uh, when folks look at the, the techniques, there's typically you know, some group inside of an organization that will develop a preference or um, uh, an inclination to use one approach versus another. We often see customers use a mix of the two approaches. Um, the next slide really then goes about describing how these be deployed in more of a web environment. And I'll use the notion of a, you know, the prospectus solution, which is a gateway solution, to help describe the approach. Um, in this scenario, this software gateway is sitting between the end user of a cloud application and the cloud provider themselves. Um, the, the data, the sensitive data, goes through the prospectus data, uh, this prospectus gateway. And inside of the gateway, in essence, are the policies that have been described by the security and the privacy compliance teams inside the enterprise. The data that's deemed sensitive will be either a token or an encrypted value, as I just described before it leaves the enterprise and goes out to the cloud environment. Data that's not sensitive um, can just pass through as clear text. Now on the way back in to the organization, the end user retrieves the data. Uh, the sensitive data that's been either encrypted or tokenized will be brought back into its original form before it's presented back to the end user that's using the application. Now a, a key part of the, the gateway's intelligence that it needs to be able to be what I call transparent to the end user. So even though information, let's say my first name, Jerry, has been tokenized or encrypted, the end user should still be able to pull up that record ID, for instance, by doing a search uh, on my first name or last name, even though the data has been encrypted. So that idea of transparency and usability is a key aspect of what these gateways need to be able to provide, together with the very strong encryption. So when implemented properly, the privacy and the security teams will get the data uh, protection they need being able to control that data location. The end users get the application usability, 
and uh, the platform, as, as Patrick described earlier, should be able to support multiple clouds, multiple applications, just as the, the Ping Identity Solution does on, on application access. Now, the last slide I'll describe before I go into the joint solution uh, overview with, with Ping Identity is to just describe a bit about where the, the gateway sits, um, because it, this will set the context for how the, the, the use cases um, that we'll describe next work. Uh, the, the gateway is typically deployed either inside of a firewall or uh, in a DMZ as a reverse proxy. And again, the users that are accessing the cloud applications will be routed through the prospectus uh, gateway in this scenario to environments. And it's the, if you think about it, given what Patrick described earlier, now you have multiple security layers that need to come into play. And that's where the, the interoperability and the solution Design between perspectivity was developed. So, David, if you can actually jump ahead two slides, um, I just wanted to mention quickly a, a Gartner report that's uh, called "The Growing Importance of Cloud Access Security Brokers." Uh, it was a report that came out last year, and they highlighted the need for this kind of a layered approach of security to to deal with these issues of loss of control. And they said clearly that one of the challenges for enterprises is that they need to make these uh, technologies work together. So that's where we first started to work with Ping to basically create this interoperability out of the box. And our design tenant was that the end user experience needed to be seamless. Uh, so when, when Ping identity solutions were being used to help secure access to cloud environments, and Prospectus was also being used in a similar situation to help control data location, we needed to make sure that the IT and the enterprise professionals, security professionals that were you know, creating this infrastructure were able to put together a solution that was going to be as seamless as possible to the end user. And that's really the, the, the core of what we've de developed together. And as I went out and I worked with some of our customers uh, that are deploying the solution, have deployed the solution, I've seen two models that I wanted to highlight in the next two slides that, um, that I've seen deployed on how the technologies are working together behind the scenes. Um, now, it's important to note on both of these, I'm describing what's more of our reverse proxy solution that's you know, typically deployed in a, a DMZ environment that allows access from both internal and external remote users that need to access these cloud applications. Um, so in, in the first example, it's what I call uh, SP-initiated SSO, so service provider-initiated. Uh, we're looking uh, at a situation where the users are connecting to Salesforce, and in, in this example, and Salesforce then is initiating the authentication process. And just to get into a little bit of the technology, in this sort of scenario, the user receives a SAML request from Salesforce and is redirected to Ping where the user authenticates. And then in this situation, Ping then generates a SAML assertion, and this is sent in the browser to Salesforce via the Prospectus gateway. Salesforce then validates the assertion and verifies a certificate signature permitting the user to connect. So I think straightforward in concept, quite honestly, took some clever work together um, to, to make it seamless. And I see this deployed as a technique quite a bit uh, in our customers that are working together with both solutions. The other one I wanted to highlight that I, I've seen out there a number of times is more of a, a identity provider initiated SSO where the user first connects and authenticates with ping. And when the user um, authentication uh, is, you know, selects Salesforce, so let's say in Patrick's example, that, that's an application that is uh, open to the, the end user, the IT group has set it up that way, ping creates the SAML assertion and forwards to Salesforce via the prospectus reverse proxy. So like our previous example, Salesforce will validate the assertion and verify the certificate signature permitting the user to connect. And in both scenarios, all, all this is happening behind the scenes from an end user perspective, and it creates this layered security solution that you know, Gartner talked about in the cloud access security broker piece that gives you know, the access and the data con location control that enterprises need to confidently move to the cloud. So with that, I'll hand back to David Stott. He'll close out the, kind of the, the formal portion of the webinar, and we can open it up to questions at this point as well. Thanks, Jerry. Before we wrap up with questions, um, I was going to ask Patrick if you wanted to quickly introduce your upcoming event for the audience. <clears throat> Certainly, thank you. Yes, I just want to uh, give, it, give everybody a heads up that Ping's running our fourth Cloud Identity Summit 
part uh, sort of set of sessions that are focused on you know anything and everything around identity and access for the cloud with you know with moving into mobile and moving into consumer and social uh, all sorts of stuff like that uh, this year we've moved it uh, it used to be up in the mountains uh, in Colorado but now this year we're going to actually move it out and we're going to have it out in the Napa Valley in uh, California just north of San Francisco so uh, hopefully some of we'll see some of you there that was great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I, I do see we have a few questions that are coming in. Um, if, if anyone has questions for either Jerry or Patrick, by all means, please enter them into the question uh, window within the um, GoTo uh, webinar sort of screen control you have. Um, and again, like I said, anything we can't cover today, we'll be happy to cover offline, um, directing these to one of our featured speakers. I'll give everyone a few seconds. Okay, we okay. We, we have one question that came in. Um, this one I think I'll probably direct to Jerry. Um, Jerry, if you don't mind, it was I think it was the questioner is asking a little bit about um, comments you made regarding um, the encryption. So they're asking specifically about uh, FIPS compliance. Um, just in general, could you add a little bit more about what that is and, and where they could find out more information regarding that standard? Sure, sure. So. Um I think one of the things that we see quite a bit, uh, whether it be public sector, government organizations, more heavily regulated uh, enterprises, they'll have certain guidelines or uh, approaches on encryption that they'll try to adhere to. And, and more often than not, many of them have selected that they want a certain level of certification on the modules they use to feel comfortable that the modules have the right strength, um, that they're implemented in the correct way, et cetera. And that's where this idea of a FIPS uh, validation or certification level comes into play. And you can actually do some quick work on the web, go to a group called NIST, which is the group inside of the government that certifies uh, and maintains kind of the, the validation level on many modules, and you'll see um, the certification levels of modules that are out there. One that we see quite a bit that's um, used and approved for kind of use inside of government and financial service organizations, as an example, are FIPS 140-2 um, certified modules. And that means that, uh, and you'll see it out there on the sites, that the, the module has been basically certified with certain standards. And it's, you have to be knowledgeable on the standards to make sure you're implementing security that's going to meet your requirements. Great. Thanks, Jerry. Um, there's been a number of questions regarding the availability of the slides. And just to um, just to remind everybody, we will be sending out um, a link to both uh, the recording of the presentation and the copy of the slides following the presentation today. So that will be made available. Uh, Jerry, a question, uh, another question came in, actually, if you don't mind. Um, the question asks, um, can we clarify the distinction between tokens, uh, tokenization, versus keys for encryption um, and the corresponding key or token management uh, issues? Sure. Any color you want to add there? Sorry. Sure. So the idea of a token is, again, going back to the, what I described, there, there's this idea of a random generation of a surrogate value that is then becomes the token. And then the lookup table, quote unquote, is this token vault. Uh, think about it as a long table that maps the token surrogate to the original value. And that vault itself is typically encrypted and maintained inside of an organization, inside of their full control. Um, there's no idea that there's kind of a mathematical one-to-one -one relationship between the token and the original value. Um, many organizations we work with, they like the idea of the complete randomness of the surrogate value to the original, together with the fact that there's no, quote, unquote, keys to maintain. Uh, and that goes into the, the primary difference with encryption. Um, the idea that there's encryption keys that need to be maintained, used, updated to um, to change a, a clear text value to the cipher text equivalent. The idea of a mathematical translation of uh, using the, the algorithm and the key between the original value and the cipher text, which is then the, the, um, the encryption process occurring. Um, you know, when you're using encryption as a technique, there are you know, requirements operationally for maintaining keys, changing keys, rotating keys that need to be thought about from a process standpoint 
by the enterprise. And when you use tokenization, that, that set of processes is not required because the techniques are fundamentally different. Great. Thanks, Jerry. Um, again, Jerry, if you're okay, one more question. Um, I think this probably kind of stems from one of the diagrams you um, you highlighted in the presentation, but the question is, how would we deal with mobile devices that are off the corporate network that need to access uh, need access to the SaaS offering? Um, so, uh, actually, why don't I ask first of all, Jerry, to answer from a uh, a cloud data protection perspective, and maybe Patrick from a from a identity perspective. So, would you know, would you force them to use a particular reverse proxy? Must they always VPN in, etc.? So, Jerry, why sure. don't you try to address that first, and then Patrick can answer from an identity management perspective. Sure, sure. So fr from our perspective, we see two different models. Um, some enterprises do indeed want their users to, uh, for security purposes, use a VPN to access uh, when, re when they're remote. And of course, they, they can do that and access the pers prospective servers those, way, those same ways to, to basically route traffic out to then the, the public-facing internet and the cloud applications. But more often than not, what we see is that uh, many enterprises will be, you know, uh, reluctant to kind of force their mobile and remote users to use a VPN. So in those situations, they deploy the prospectus gateway or reverse proxy in what, you know, a DMZ environment that has uh, the ability to take in just through URL redirects those remote users, bring them through the proxy. The policies are then administered, as I described, and they can access the cloud environments th that way, so not requiring a VPN. Patrick? Yeah, I was going to add that you know one of the problems you have is if you have somebody on a mobile uh, mobile device just going straight to a SaaS application, the, the the problem then becomes how do you force the user back you know back into the corporate controlled IT environment, um, specifically the uh, the proxy. And one of the things we see is that the benefits of implementing single sign-on is that in the say the the, the SP initiated diagram we showed previously that um, the user can't log into the SaaS app unless he's redirected back to his enterprise for authentication. Uh, and now that, they're, now that they're sort of captured back at the enterprise, uh, we can do some URL redirects to push the browser back out through the proxy server so that um, the, they, they, they go out now through the right sort of gateway to get to the cloud and SaaS application. That's great. I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, and there are actually quite a few coming in. So, Jerry, this one um, probably a good, a good, a good, uh, good concept to cover. Um, if we're using tokenization, um, how, where is the data to token mapping table, and uh, how might it be secured? Sure. So, so the, the idea of this, the mapping table or the the token vault that I described. I've seen two sorts of deployments. Um, one is for enterprises that want to actually maintain that environment inside their own data center, so inside their firewall. I've seen the, the token table, for instance, in an Oracle database uh, that's been hardened and encrypted itself, uh, so that's how it's secured, maintained inside of the organization's uh, data center. Um, I've also seen deployments where Prospectus is being deployed more as a managed security service. An example would be via one of our partners, Fujitsu, which comes to mind, where the, the primary requirement was data residency. Um, I described sort of those, those three, compliance, residency, and general security. When, when residency is the requirement, the data doesn't necessarily have to be inside the corporate environment, but it needs to be in a specific geography. So Fujitsu deploys the solution on behalf of a number of customers where the, the data uh, center from Fujitsu is in the environment, oh, sorry, in the, in the geography and they're able to deploy the token database as part of the solution inside of their data center, again, in a hardened database that's encrypted itself, um, and it's deployed as a managed service as part of the prospectus uh, gateway offering that they, that they uh, provide on behalf of a client. So think of it almost as a staging cloud environment before the information goes out to the public cloud. Excellent. Thanks, Jerry. Sure. And I think with that, I want to thank everyone for their participation in today's webinar. And by all means, for more information, we'd welcome people to visit either Ping Identity at www.pingidentity.com or Prospectus at www.prospectus.com. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day.